Welcome to St. Paul's United Church here in Midland, Ontario. We are happy to have you come and join us in this season of Easter. Today we have a very different and I think a very special worship for you. Uh, Joy and George Bott are going to be taking the service for us this Sunday and they have actually been filming the service from their church at St. John's United Church in Marathon, Ontario, in Northern Ontario. And it's a, it's a really neat place on Lake Superior mm. and uh, Keith and I went and tootled around in, in that community and we are so grateful for the Bots. They, um, they are scheduled also to be guest preachers in the summer, but we thought it might be nice to give the worship team a bit of a break, <laughs> just a tad. And they came to our rescue, um, and they have provided a lovely service mm-hmm. for us, and we so appreciate it. They are um, leaders in what is called the Lay uh, Worship Leaders Program, and they teach it for all of Canada. Mm. And they have a website that's also called uh, United in Worship, and they are uh, got a grant from the United Church of Canada with that from the foundation, as well as they're in the Canadian Shield regional area. Right. So I think you're really going to like uh, Joy and George. Um, we In the service, Joy has a really good question. She asks you, where is Jesus for you? And I'm hoping you'll, you'll listen to her questions and ponder them because they're great questions to engage us in our faith. So thank you for that. And the worship with our service today. Right. So they provided the uh, text part of the service with spots then to drop yeah. music in. So we yeah. um, have uh, provided the opening hymn today is um, Hannah Berry, again, singing um, Morning Has Broken. Hannah Berry from Scotland, Glasgow, Scotland. Yeah. And it's a outside. great Easter song. I never thought of it as an Easter song, but like the first morning, the first yeah. morning of Easter, yeah. but it, it goes on into praising and yeah, it fits with Easter, but I'd never yeah. thought of it that way. And again, she sings it so beautifully. Oh, so yes. hope you enjoy hearing Hannah again. Uh, our closing hymn is um, Shayla Brown singing as the sun with longer journey, which was part of the Good Friday service. But you had also, we discussed how that was appropriate. Yeah, listen to those words because they're, they, 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 they start out with grief, but then they break into hope mm-hmm. and new beginnings. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're actually quite neat. And, and Shayla, you know, she has to memorize all of these words because she is um, unable to see them mm-hmm. and, uh, and the music and she has to learn it and she does a, such a marvelous she job. She yeah, does. we're so blessed to have Shayla. We are indeed, sure. yes. She's yeah. my go-to for yeah, sure quite exactly. often. <laughs> and you have an offertory. Uh, the offertory is uh, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, also one that um, has been pre-recorded. I don't know from what date. Yeah. I have a sleeveless top on, so I could have <laughs> been you warm. Go. We're getting there, but not quite yet. <laughs> but it is nice to have, so we're just recording the welcome and announcements. Um, just mm-hmm. kind of regroup, right? Because, yeah. you know, Easter is a little like Christmas in that you, you're so busy you're and there's so, so busy. much yeah. so, and so many services. So it's nice to yeah. just have a, li- little, a little bit of time bit of break. to yeah, regroup and plan. Yeah, for sure, because we are tired and worship takes a lot uh, more. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know you're tired and we know that you do have um, a pandemic fatigue right now. And of course, we've gone into an even tighter lockdown. A stay at home order is now in place for all of the province of Ontario. Mm-hmm. We're hoping no matter how fatigued you are with this pandemic that, that you will stay at home. Don't risk going out with that variant. Even if you have your vaccine, you can still be a carrier to those who don't. And uh, God calls us to love God, ourselves, and others. And that's one way you can love yourself and others by simply staying put until we get past this third wave. Indeed. This is going to end sometime. We've come too far to mess it up now. (laughs) Very good point. Very good point. So in keeping with the planning, um, here's a little piece of planning that occurred to me on one of my walks. 
to do um, uh, pretty much all music service in the summer. I did the same last uh, last year, and we had some guest organists, and uh, Ken Woods was mm -hmm. here with mm -hmm. me. Um, so there are likely hymns that you love, and hymns in particular that have helped you get through COVID um, this past year and plus plus. Um, send me the title, if you would, of your favorite hymn that has helped you through COVID. And I thought I could gather all of those titles. Now, I'm not going to be able to likely use them all. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe we could thread together a service um, using favorite music. Absolutely. Your favorite, your favorite music. music. And that includes people online as well as people in our congregation. Yes. And so I be, I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, so happens So I'll just with say that, that on, the, on the choir call, um, I put it to the choir members and um, one choir member said, you're going to get 509 <laughs> 100 times, which is I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. Sky. So if that's your favorite COVID hymn, you don't need to send me that one. <laughs> That will be included. Already. Uh, that's a given, yes. <laughs> but we do need you to send them now, even though the summer's a while off, mm -hmm. be because of how much work it takes yeah. to pre-plan and get everything ready. Yeah. Well, speaking of getting everything ready, following this service or before, depending on when you watch <laughs> the service, uh, Sunday 11 o'clock is our uh, Zoom coffee hour. We're really hoping you'll join us. Uh, it's great fun, and we have uh, some uh, interesting things that we're going to try to bring uh, more to the coffee hour. So hmm. hope to see you soon on that. Very cool. For sure. Yeah. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention was that um, the United Church of Canada has asked us to uh, do a vigil on April the 8th for um, guaranteed livable income. And if you're living in poverty, I don't have to tell you about how difficult it is. People piecing together two, three, four jobs. No longer do you get full-time employment. Part-time employment means there's no benefit programs, and it is really, really difficult. And so we're asking you to light a candle, shine a light, and be part of a movement to try to address poverty by providing a guaranteed livable income. So because we're on lockdown and we're not going to be able to gather on the 8th, I am going to light this candle uh, right now. And may it remind us that we are seeking uh, a livable income for all people. So we are going to go into worship. It's not in our sanctuary, but the great benefit for us has been working with other churches in this time. And we are sister churches, and we are Christians walking the path together. So thank you again, George and Joy, for bringing this service to us. We appreciate it very much. Let us worship our God. Welcome everyone. We're so glad to be worshiping with you today. Today your worship is coming from St. John's United Church in Marathon through the United in Worship Project. My name is Joy Bott and I'm one of your worship leaders and my partner George will be the other worship leader and you'll see him a little bit later. We are delighted to be worshiping with you this morning and my only sadness is that I didn't get a chance to worship with the people of St. Paul's before this happened, because I would love to be imagining your faces on the other side of this camera. A couple of housekeeping items for you. First of all, our sermon this morning is um, Sharon, Dr. Sharon Ballantyne, 
a minister who's in um, Peterborough right now, uh, wrote the sermon and I've adapted it so that we can work with it today. The other thing is that uh, on the screen sometimes you will see some words in yellow. And this is your time to participate in our service. Worship isn't passive, it's active. And this is one of the ways that we can be active on the other side of our computers or our televisions. We can shout out those words with strength and with love that are written in yellow, that belong in with other prayers that uh, George or I will share with you. And so we begin to worship. We light the Christ candle to speak words of peace as God is with us where we are. The word of life reached out, breathing new hope, new courage, and new strength to us. We light the Christ candle for our community, inviting God to stretch out our hands to share hope and healing healing gratitude with others. The word of life walked out, emptying death's tomb, offering new life. We light the candle for our world, challenging us to share love, light, prayers for peace, and hope for all creation. Since time immemorial, First people's lives and spirituality have been deeply connected to this land. We acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose territory we are on in Marathon. In Marathon, the people of Begitgong Nishnabig. We acknowledge and give thanks to their stewardship. May we live with respect and gratitude on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. God be with you. And also with you. By grace, we greet this new morning. By grace, we come to share God's love. We celebrate Christ is alive. We are loved, forgiven, and free. Receive hope and healing. We offer thanks and praise. And let's pray together. Holy mystery, how can it be? We crucify Christ day to day, year to year. We celebrate that the tomb is empty, and yet we meet in the safety of a locked room. Blow through us in our worship today. Blow into us your presence, your delight, your, your hope. hope. Infuse us with the courage and strength and energy to, to fill, fill our, our faith, faith tank, tank and leave here re-energized to journey with you to continue to do your work. Amen. Amen. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Holy One, when we need proof of you in the world, when we hold too tight to the past, you offer your breath and your grace. When we cling to old hurts, use our words and our actions to wound others, fail to forgive those who hold our past against us, hurt others with or without intention, you offer your love, healing, hope, and peace. When we separate ourselves from you, you offer for your, your forgiveness, forgiveness, loving, loving Christ, Christ, and bring us back to you. You open closed hearts and heal injured souls. It is through your love and forgiveness that we find healing and freedom. Amen. Amen. I have a table to set for you. A plant that came from my living room, a lemon and an apple. A loaf of bread and the locks that are on our table. And a surprise item that's right here. I don't seem to have very much space on this table at all. Okay, today we're going to, we're talking about seeing Jesus. And we all know, we know the scripture that we're going to read a little later about Jesus meeting with the disciples. And we know that Jesus met multiple times in multiple places. But I wonder, do we ever look for Jesus? So where do you see Jesus? I'm going to share some places with you that I might look for Jesus and find him. But if you're by yourself, maybe do some thinking, maybe pick up a pencil and do some writing about where you found Jesus this past week. And if you have somebody else sitting with you, this is a wonderful time to talk about where you find Jesus working hard in this world. Well, first of all, I want to share with you that I find Jesus a lot in nature, sometimes inside the house and sometimes outside the house, in nature. Nature, I love to go and sit by the lake. I love to find Jesus there. We all know about the Christ candle that I left here. Because we've talked about that already this morning, I find Jesus lots of times in the wonderful food that we share with each other that is so easily, easily found by us in our world, at our grocery stores, in our backyards, in our gardens. And it often makes me think that if I were to go somewhere where someone didn't have the same food security that I have, I'd find Jesus there working at, at providing food security for the homeless and those who are finding in this pandemic times really tough times in feeding themselves. And I don't have any trouble, and you wouldn't have any trouble either, finding Jesus in the loaf of bread for communion. But I'll tell you, this isn't a loaf of bread for communion. This is a loaf of bread for my lunch. Hmm. Will I find Jesus? Will I remember Jesus when I break this loaf of bread? Not in communion, just in my own kitchen. And of course, we have rocks. Of course, We have so many other places that we can find Jesus. But this one... I want to talk to you, let me see if I can get it in the camera, I want to talk to you about, if I turn it around, you're going to see um, what's, what's happening in the, in the tech part of this. But I'm going to tell you that it is a mirror. And I'm going to look in that mirror. Will I see Jesus? 
I want you to try that at home. You don't have to run and do it right now. But I want you to find a mirror, and I want you to look in that mirror and find Jesus in yourself. Because I want everyone you meet today to find Jesus. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 20, reading verses 19 to 31. And this morning I'm reading from the message. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were awestruck. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. And then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We saw the master, but he said, Unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail hole and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. And Jesus said, So do you believe because you've seen with your own eyes? Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. 
Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than were written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. May God's Spirit shape our understanding of these words and they awaken in our hearts. What powerful experiences we are part of this morning. Jesus makes resurrection appearances pretty powerful. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples. The disciples become apostles, the ones sent out by God, those acting as Jesus' hands and feet in the beginning church. Familiar stories, and yet ones with messages for us that can be just as powerful as they were for them. I wonder, have we put away our experiences of the cross and the Easter celebration? Did we do that last Sunday? Do we believe we are ready to live as people living in the season after Easter? Or do we have some work to do? Well, we're pretty lucky because this season, Eastertide, takes us not through just a season of Sundays after Easter, but a season journeying seven weeks to Pentecost. This is the season in which, which we celebrate the Sundays of Easter. We have focused for so long, it seems, on the 40 days of Lent preceding Easter, that we just might think we're done with all that work on our faith journey. But what are we called to do and be in our post-Easter realities? In this text that George read, we're called to wrestle, wrestle with what it means for us being sent out in our faith experiences, in the present moment of our lives, individually, within our families, within this community of faith, and of course our wider community and the world. In this 20th chapter of John, Jesus, the risen Lord, gives instruction to Mary, to the disciples, and to us, that we are sent out to share this faith we embrace. I wonder if too often we live it as if we're still behind those locked doors. Sure, we have missional outreach in our communities of faith that's dressed in social justice and community-minded ventures. We celebrate, we, we give, we take out food, we box food in food banks. We reach out in care and concern for other causes, all part of our spreading our acts of kindness, our outreach. It's fine to say that, but this year has really set us back on our heels, hasn't it? What have we been actually able to physically do during this year of pandemic? How have we shared without being together, without a handshake, without a hug, without passing the peace to one another, let alone to the world? At St. John's, we stream our services from the sanctuary, and there are only six of us there, the minister, the pianist, and three tech people. So how do we invite others to discuss our faith, to offer prayers, to invite somebody else to come to church when we can't come to church? This doesn't even consider that we feel awkward discussing our faith outside our spiritual friends why, we can't even do that now unless we search for an online Bible, worship or Bible study somewhere. Lots of folks used to come regularly to Easter services. But did we see them this year? How many of you will go home today and call those people to invite them to come to next week's service or just to share, show them that we care? We aren't likely to get persecuted or fear for our lives like the early church folk were. So what are we going to do about the need to share the good news? 
A few weeks ago, our worship committee was discussing this in the guise of wondering how we can get online worshipers to participate more. And we recognized that in the building, we would have greeters to welcome, to chat about happenings during the week, and to ask the question, how is it with your soul this morning? And so we decided to be greeters online in the chat box. And we are totally amazed by the quality and quantity of the chat. It has changed so much before and after worship and even during the sermon because people are posting questions and thoughts about what they're hearing. If we revisit that text in John, we find much about the life experience of grief, confusion, loss, fear, doubt, challenges of peace, and facing a violent death. The disciples in today's reading, in fear, are behind locked doors, afraid of what those in positions of power will do to them. And they're also hiding, likely in shame and guilt and grief, as well as shock. And being overwhelmed is likely an understatement. Reverend Kate Matthews writes, the disciples after Jesus died huddled together in their fear and confusion, not knowing where to turn or what to do next. Their leader and their teacher who had held them together all those long months was dead and buried, executed like a common criminal and lying in a tomb, or so they thought. What a disappointing turn of events. With Jesus into that tomb, went their hope, their vision, their sense of direction, and their purpose in life. They were left only with an overwhelming sense of failure and shame because they knew they deserted Jesus in his hour of need. They were disappointed and delusioned, disillusioned. I wonder, were they more disappointed and disillusioned with themselves or with Jesus, who had raised their hopes so high? It'd be hard to get your arms around that kind of disappointment, to organize that feeling that kind of loss would bring, or to bring under control that depth of shame. They must have indeed felt small, weak, and inadequate. How many of us are feeling that way right now with pandemic lockdowns again? No singing, no gathering, even it seems, hiding our faces behind a mask. But Jesus never, never leaves us in that spot. Jesus brings the gift of peace and grace, of acceptance as he appears, appears among them. Did you see the moderator's Easter message this past week where Mary tells Peter about her experience in the garden? How frustrating it must have been for her to deliver a message that's given little credence and yet at the very end, Peter as much as says, well, I guess I'll go. And then says to us, will you? Will you and I go to Galilee, enter the room with the disciples, lock the doors, and see what happens? Kristen Johnson Largan describes the gift Jesus brings to the frightened disciples and to all of us today the peace that brings back into the fold the outcast and the marginalized and once again turns upside down the societal conventions of first and last and blessed and cursed and rich and poor. Jesus' peace invites the lion to see lamb as neighbor, late neighbor and friend, the Jew to speak with the Samaritan and the prostitute to dine with the Pharisee. Largan cautions, however, that the Christian ideals of inclusion, love, and justice are ironically met in every age with rejection and harassment. Just think back to the past year. What's been met with rejection and harassment that are ideals of love, inclusion, and justice? Really doesn't take much thinking at all, does it, to come up with Black Lives Matter? exclusion of transgender people, people of color being more likely to die of coronavirus, and so on. 
we need to embody the kind of peace Jesus brought to those frightened, overwhelmed disciples. To feel it and then to take it out to the world. Jesus stands among the disciples. We're there, remember. Appears, shares message of peace be with you, showing them his wounded hands and his side, and repeats the message. Peace be with you, as God has sent me, so I send you. Jesus breathes on them with the message, receive the Holy Spirit, which we probably more commonly associate with the message of a later time of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts. But in the Gospel of John, it's on the day of Jesus' first appearance that this happens. And we often miss that focus. Will this help the apostles and us feel safer? Are we and they feeling different, having been filled with the Spirit? Jesus the Christ has risen. Returning to our text, remember that Jesus is providing welcome invitation of peace be with you. God comes to us. The Easter story is not about Mary Magdalene, though we learn powerfully from her experiences. It's not about disciples becoming apostles, again, though they are powerful models. It's not about doubting Thomas, though he too is a powerful example for us. The core is Jesus coming, appearing, being with us, even in the unexpected, in the surprising moments. Jesus is with us even when the doors are locked and chained. Jesus refused to let anything get in the way of being with those who are struggling. Not death, not locks or chains. Even if we're at the far reaches of our faith, struggling, questioning, doubting, Jesus is there to meet us in our situation. We hear lots of reminders to see the face of Jesus in others or ourselves and realizing that ours might be the only face of Jesus another encounters in their time of need. God is always with us. Jesus finds us. The Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus is really talking to them, the disciples and us, because we're there too. When he says to Thomas the words that Eugene Peterson renders in the message as, even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing even better blessings. That's the promise of the church. We continue to live better blessings. This united church of ours dares faith, risks hope, and is determined to thrive. We are an Easter people. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. What is it? that we will offer to God today, our time, our energy, our love, our service. Take a moment to reflect on your offering. And we continue with prayers of the people. Please, let's pray. We come today with thankfulness in our hearts. And in the silence of our hearts, we offer thanks for our many blessings, for all that you are, for all that you make us to be. There are thoughts and worries that lay heavily on our hearts and minds today, God. We ask your blessings for our family and our friends. We ask your blessings for our neighborhoods and for our communities. We ask your blessings on our country, 
and on this world. And we listen for your voice, God. How can we be your hands and feet in this world? We ask all of this in love and in the name of the Christ who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father and Mother, found in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And so now I invite you to go now in peace and forgiveness, free to serve and follow the way of Jesus. The Lord has opened our hearts to the resurrection surprises. We are sent from here, risking faith and daring hope, energized to meet what is ahead of us. We go as Easter people, guided by the Spirit, renewed in mind, body, and spirit. And now may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours this day and forevermore. Amen.